I uh, wanted to welcome everyone. You are at the YANA webinar on blocks and levers in economic mobility. This uh, promises to be a really engaging in-depth discussion on some of the factors that contribute to economic inequalities and some of the policies and interventions that do or could, as we'll find out, promote uh, better economic uh, mobility and equality in our country. Uh, my name is Rachel Littman. I'm Yale College class of 91. I'm the YANA Executive Director. I am very pleased to be joined this evening by some really terrific Yale affiliated uh, individuals and I'm going to welcome them and give just a short bio for each of them. Uh, because we were recording this in audio and visual and for those who like to listen to podcasts, we want to make sure you have all the information in your head as we move forward. So in no particular order, I'm welcoming Charlie Homer, uh, Yale College class of 76. Uh, Charlie has uh, worked as a practicing physician a nonprofit leader, a program evaluator and advisor, and a policy official. He's currently the senior advisor at Economic Mobility Pathways, uh, which we're going to hear some about today. Uh, that is a Boston-based nonprofit organization that is working to disrupt poverty. He has also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services Policy, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, and U.S. Department of uh, in the U.S. Department of Homeland uh, and uh, sorry, Health and Human Services under the Obama administration. Uh, importantly, he co-founded and ran the National Institute for Children's Health Equity, or Health Quality, and he's also an associate clinical professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, the co-chair of the advisory board of Children's Health Watch, and a member of the executive committee of the Massachusetts Child and Adolescent Health Initiative. So thank you, Charlie. It is a uh, pleasure to have you, and thank you for joining us. I also want to wrap, we're waiting for Zach, so I'm going to, uh, Marcus Heyman uh, is a partner. Welcome, Marcus. He's a class of 05. He is a partner at Dahlberg Advisors, a global strategy uh, uh, and advisory firm where he co-leads their justice, equity, and economic mobility practice. And he also advises clients on strategies to advance racial equity, build and shift power, and economic mobility. Some of the many projects that Marcus has worked on include collaborating with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Urban Institute to develop the vision for an economic mobility alliance. He's led strategic planning process for First Lady Michelle Obama's uh, Reach Higher College Access Initiative. And he's also engaged with UN Women to um, mobilize uh, over a billion US dollars to drive gender equality. He was the inaugural director of operations and special projects at Color of Change, which is a leading racial justice organization, which hopefully we'll hear about. Uh, he's also worked at the Roberts Enterprise Development Fund, a venture philanthropy that invests in employment generating social enterprises, and the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is a community development financial institution. And very interestingly, Marcus began his career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco and speaks several languages. So welcome, Marcus. Also pleased uh, to, to bring in Rourke O'Brien, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Yale. Uh, professor O'Brien focuses on demography, inequality, household and public finance, economic mobility, population health, and a bunch of other uh, related topics. He has served as the senior policy advisor for consumer policy at US Department of the Treasury and as a research fellow and policy analyst at the New America Foundation as well as consulting for the Annie E. Casey Foundation Center for Financial Services Innovation and US Financial Diaries Project. And he has an extensive CV, so I would like the other ones, I would recommend that you look up their full bios. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, Zachary uh, Gleamer to join us at the Yale Club, I just want to give you introduce Justin so you know who he is when he comes on. Uh, Zach is an economist uh, and a new addition to the Yale School of Management faculty. He's also faculty associate at Opportunity Insights which is a nonpartisan, uh, not-for-profit organization run by, I'm sure everybody knows, Raj Chetty up at Harvard. Uh, and that organization seeks to translate insights from rigorous scientific research to policy change by harnessing the power of big data and using an interdisciplinary approach. And uh, interestingly, if you check out Zach's uh, personal website, you'll also see not only the academic research like other academic CVs, but he also has links to some of his worldly and cultural travels. It's one of those, you know, places bin apps in a living thing. So if you want to see how you compare to Zach's travels and where he's been in major museums and things, I, I recommend it. It's fascinating. Um, anyway, uh, welcome everyone. And, and we'll wait for the Yale Club folks, uh, Zach, to, to plug in as, as we get there. Uh, but 
rather than giving a background I couldn't possibly encapsulate it all, I thought I would start with the professionals themselves. And just let's just start with, you know, what does economic mobility look like in the United States today? Uh, what are the factors? And and maybe we'll we'll start with someone who's into data. And uh, Rourke, we're going to start with you. From your perspective, what does it look like today? Yeah, no, great. It's a it's an important opening question. And then thanks so much, Rachel, for the invitation and for organizing this conversation. So uh, we're at a really exciting moment in studying economic mobility. There have just been these tremendous advances in in data, which have allowed us to really get a good sense of what economic mobility looks like. So so obviously, when we're talking about economic mobility, we're talking about uh, the transmission of economic status through generations, right? So from parents to children. So there are a couple of ways that we can think about this. One is to ask the simple question, you know, what fraction of children when they grow up end up earning more than their parents did in adulthood, right? This is kind of the classic conception of the American dream. We all want our kids to do better than we did, right? The next generation should do better. So when you look at, when you look at tax data and we look at the incomes of parents and their children, we see that for cohorts born in the 1940s, right? So uh, folks are in their 80s today, right? So folks born in the 1940s, about 90% of those children, when they became adults, would out earn their parents, right? So about 90% of, of American children at that time were achieving the American dream. We flash forward and we look at cohorts, say, that were born in the 1980s, like myself, uh, we see that that number falls to about only 50%. So only about 50% of cohorts in the 1980s when their adults actually end up earning more than their parents, right? So that's a huge decline uh, over the last several decades. Uh, and what's uh, important here is that, that decline has affected everybody at all parts of the income distribution. So if you are rich, if you're poor, everyone now has a, a lower odds of doing better than their parents. But it's really the middle class, right? We've seen those likelihoods fall quite a bit, which is undermining, underlining some of that precarity that the middle feels. Um, just a few other ways to think about this. So another way we can do is we can think about how tightly correlated the incomes of parents and children are. And we can ask questions like, conditional on being born to parents, say at the 25th percentile of income, where on average do you end up in adulthood, right? So this is comparing apples to apples. So kids born to households at the 25th percentile, where do they end up? Well, we see on average for recent cohorts, they end up uh, around the 45th percentile, right? Little regression to the mean on average, right? But what's much more interesting is to, is to look at this, how it varies by different population subgroups. So for example, we see that no matter where you look at the income distribution, Black Americans achieve uh, less upward mobility than their white counterparts, right? So at any point in the income distribution, uh, uh, Black Americans are less likely to be upwardly mobile and much more likely to be downwardly mobile than whites. And if you zoom even closer in the data, you see this interesting, important kind of gender contrast. And specifically, that last stat I told you is, is entirely based on the mobility outcomes of Black, Amer of black males. So it's Black males who um, are really falling behind, not able to kind of climb up the income ladder, are much more likely to fall down um, relative to white males. Whereas Black females actually, conditional and starting at the same place, actually end up at a similar place to white females, right? So this, this data is really allowing, allowing us to kind of tell these fine-grained stories about how this uh, mobility patterns operate for different parts of the population. And the last thing I'll point out, um, and which is, oh, I think, often the case with these data when you see it appear on the New York Times homepage, is that these data have revealed remarkable variation across places in, in the levels of upward mobility, right? That in some communities, uh, low-income children have a much higher likelihood of climbing that income ladder in adulthood than in other communities. And this has just uh, 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 instantiated a whole uh, uh, industry of researchers and academics and, um, and policymakers trying to understand what is it about those places that, that lead some places to be more mobile than others, and how can we try to replicate that? Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that, Perlena. And we're going to come back to this theme about places because we found it kind of it relates not only to research, but some lived experiences and where philanthropy and community investment is going. And on that, Marcus, I'd love to, to, to shift over to you. And, and from your the work that you've done, the work you're doing now, you know, what does economic mobility look like now from your perspective and from people you work with? Sure. Well, thanks, Rachel, for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, and so what I would say is I, I would differentiate between when we think about economic mobility, I would differentiate between population level outcomes, so sort of outcomes for individuals and field level outcomes. And so what does it look like to be a functional economic mobility field? 
in a field that is fundamentally trying to uplift the population level outcomes that I think Rourke was talking about. And I know a lot of the other individuals on this call really focus on. And so typically in my work, right, as, as a strategy advisory firm, I'm working with nonprofits, corporates, philanthropies, and yes, in some respects, they're focusing on the long-term population level outcomes, but they're asking themselves, what are the ways in which I can, as an intermediary, as a national organization, support the field to function a bit more effectively? And so from that vantage point, I, I do think that there are some challenges. And a few that I was writing down as I was listening to, to work speaker number one, um, in order to achieve those population level outcomes, there are so many factors at play. So there's education, there's housing, there's transportation, there's public health. And so all of those in some respects fit into economic mobility. And yet within those fields, individuals may say, well, I don't work on issues of, of economic mobility. I work on education, I work on health. And so there's this challenge between trying to reconcile the interconnections between these various subfields while recognizing that there's not necessarily an overarching perspective of this is what the economic mobility field is. And I think you see that even in the way that people define economic mobility, right? And so there's one of the core partners that, that you mentioned in my intro was, was the Urban Institute. And so for folks who are not familiar with their work would recommend you go and look at their three-part definition of economic mobility, which they developed um, in partnership with a few others. But you know, there's a difference between economic mobility and earning potential and economic success. And so for some people, that's that's how they define what this means. And so some field actors are striving towards that. Others are striving more towards how do individuals have power and autonomy over their lives? And that is a sign of economic mobility. Others are saying, well, what does it look like to feel valued in your community? And in some situations, those are at odds with each other. There are many individuals for whom attaining economic success actually decreases the belonging you have in your community. So what I'm getting at is there's so many different layers and levels of complexity when you even try to think about, well, what is the overarching North Star we're trying to get to? And for that reason, you have an economic mobility field that may ostensibly be stri striving for the same outcomes, but fundamentally is working on many different ways to get there. And so in some of our consultations we've done with, with many field actors focusing on this, they talk about an economic mobility field that's not coordinated, uh, that's mm -hmm. broken, that's competitive, that has, uh, where funding flows don't really um, reflect the needs, where we're funding to address the issues of economic mobility typically focus on white-led coastal organizations as opposed to BIPOC-led organizations. And so I could go on and on and I won't, but the broader point is from my standpoint, I think we talked about the data. The question is, what are the ways in which we can support field actors to use the data that work reference to actually uplift population level outcomes? And I think right now, there's a lot of good being done, but there's still a lot to be done to really think about how those various initiatives work in tandem. So I'll, I'll pause there and I know we'll pick up this conversation. A bit no, that's later. wonderful. I thank you because that, that's going to tee us up for later when we come back to what are some of these specific barriers or problems and then what are some ways like that you've worked with others to fix the collaboration or change some of the definitions, things like that. So we'll definitely come back to this. Zach, I'm gonna give you a second before we come to you. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move to Charlie for a second, but we've already introduced you. And by the way, your link to places been and all your cultural institutions has now been spread out to the entire Yale community. So everybody knows what states and museums you've been to. Um, Charlie, um, from your from your um, perspective, looking at uh, quality healthcare, social determinants of health, you know, what does economic mobility to the extent we're thinking loosely or variously defined, how does that look from your perspective? Sure, thanks so much. And, and again, as, as the others, thank you, Rachel, for putting this panel together and for inviting me to be a part of it. Now, looking at it from the health perspective, I think there's several different ways to look at it. One, again, many people know the Raj Chetty work, which we've already mentioned in terms of the Atlas of Economic Mobility, but he also published, or his team published a paper in JAMA that just made it very clear uh, that uh, poor individuals, for example, have a life expectancy, which is roughly 14 years. The poorest individuals roughly have a life expectancy 14 years lower than the most wealthy individuals or individuals with the highest income to be more precise. Um, 
so clearly, you know, the social conditions in which people live, and even more narrowly in this case, the economic conditions in which people live, have a profound impact on health. And you know, I we had to use those kind of slides before the pandemic. Um, since the pandemic, you know, that kind of information was on the front page of every newspaper, and so people who look at newspapers or look at science-based uh, believe in science-based. Uh, decision making know that uh, income has a profound effect. I think the next question is looking at economic mobility. And again, this uh, brings the paper again, and Rourke has done a lot of this work together with a wonderful young colleague, uh, formerly at Yale and Harvard, and I believe he, you know, certainly at Harvard now at Penn, Athan Darvang Um, who has done really important work <coughs> looking at that excuse me, that same geographic area and variation of economic mobility and correlating that as well with mortality. I mean, more narrowly, he's he and Rourke have also looked at things like when your auto plant, when the place at which you work closes, what does that do to the likelihood of, for example, developing an opioid use disorder and coming to an early death? And again, you're seeing that same kind of correlation with mortality, early mortality uh, and health risks. So both being poor and the conditions associated with being poor is bad for your health and having poor expectations, the expectation that your future is going to be bad and worse. Um, and then again, as a pediatrician, my last comment on the health side is we know that the impacts of poverty and living in disadvantaged conditions when you're young is particularly harmful. Um, so yeah, there was again, a report a couple of years ago at this point, 26, maybe 2018 from the National Academy of Science looking at uh, strategies to reduce childhood poverty by 50% and they really over 10 years and they brought together really all the literature on the impact of poverty on outcomes and shows just profound impact and a profound or sort of significantly multiple greater impact on outcomes and on costs for society by being poor in childhood and, and again there's when we move to the discussion of interventions, there's also ample data that a child moving to an environment, we start talking about places, a child in an environment that provides greater opportunity um, also has much greater impact on that child's outcome compared to, for example, the parents. The parents, when they move to a better outcome, important outcomes that Marcus was talking about do get better. People have less stress, they feel better about their lives, but their economic well-being and their sort of other outward numerical characteristics of advantage don't advance, but the children's do. So lots of lots of ways in which both poverty at any given point in time and then economic mobility and expectations for the future um, over time has a profound impact on health and well-being. Got it. Wonderful. Thank you for that perspective. All right, uh, Zach, we're going to move to you uh, to kind of put your two cents in for this general opening statement about, you know, from your perspective and your research, you know, what does economic mobility look like? What are some of the defining, you know, how, how it looks from your perspective and what terms you use to describe it or what you look at as some of the factors. So any way you wish to answer that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Again, yeah, I'll echo everyone's thanks uh, in being part of the panel. Uh, I owe everyone two apologies. The first is for spending a little bit too much time in New Haven this afternoon. And the second is uh, that I'm about to show you a bunch of uh, pictures of New Haven because I'm an economist and while we've all been talking about data, I can't uh, help myself in showing you some. So, uh, so let me just, uh, you know, the name Raj Chetty has been bouncing around a lot. I suspect we're gonna be talking about Raj a lot for the rest of the evening. Uh, I wanted to start by just giving you a little bit of in, uh, just the visual information that Raj has collected in what he calls the Opportunity Atlas. This is publicly available, opportunityatlas.org. Uh, here we have a map of the United States, and the map is color-coded by the average wage outcomes of 35-year-olds who grew up in each of these commuting zones, regions around large cities across the U.S. Blue means that they ended up relatively well off. Red means they ended up relatively low income. And what's nice about this map is, I'm not going to do it interactively, I'll just click you through some slides here, but you can start zooming in on various parts of the U.S. Here I'm slowly pulling in uh, to an area that we all know quite well. Uh, so you can see that relative to the rest of Connecticut, the area around New Haven tends to have relatively poor outcomes overall for children in that area. 
What I'm doing here is now zooming in on census tracts in New Haven, very small regions, maybe on the order of a thousand residents in each of these regions. But here I've restricted the, the map to just people who grew up in the bottom third of family incomes in these areas. And you can see basically everything is uniformly red, even the highlighted region in the center, uh, which is uh, the, the dominant part of Yale University, has relatively poor outcomes for people who grew up relatively low income in that area. Now what I'm gonna do is click through, this is the bottom third of incomes when people were growing up, what happens to them later. Here's the middle third of incomes, what happens to those kids later. And then here's the top third of incomes. And what you can see, I think is sort of two interesting features. The first is that obviously the children of relatively higher earning parents themselves end up higher earning in the future. But you can also see within even these very narrow tracks, People who grew up in different circumstances ended up with very different outcomes. So, for example, if you look at these uh, relatively lower income uh, areas of New Haven over here, these are what I'm showing you here. These are kids with quite high income parents who just grew up in low income areas. And just for that reason, it looks like these kids ended up never achieving the high incomes of their peers. There's only really kids who went to the same school system uh, right, right next to them. Uh, who grew up in a higher income region, had similar parental incomes, but went on to earn much higher incomes themselves. So this, I think, uh, is going to point to where we're going in just a moment, which is this importance of place, of the community that people grow up in, in understanding long-run outcomes for those individuals. I want to show you just quickly two other facts. The first is a, a couple of facts about uh, uh, our shared university, Yale. So this also comes uh, from research that's been conducted by Raj Jetty and co-authors. Here I've just pulled out characterization of the students at Yale University. You can see that as of 2013, so this is still this is already 10 years old, the average Yale student came from a family with an income of almost $200,000 a year. If you were to look today, it'd be substantially more than $200,000 a year. You can see uh, that about 4% of Yale students come from families in the top 0.1% of income, which is about twice the number of kids who come from families in the bottom 20% of incomes in the US. So Yale, while providing an extremely high quality and very lucrative career to its students, seems to be very explicitly tailored to identifying students who are already relatively high income prior to coming into the university, uh, to the degree that Yale could act as a mobility pipeline, something again that I think we'll be coming back to uh, over the next several minutes. Uh, this is a case in which it doesn't look like Yale, at the very least, is living up to that potential. The last thing that I want to show you is some data that we don't have for Yale University, though it's some data that I've collected uh, for a couple of other universities. Here, what I'm showing you is UC Berkeley. So uh, uh, taking a step back, so what exactly do we have here? You can see along the bottom, these are ages from roughly age 22 through 62. So this is the entire uh, span of an individual's career. And what I'm showing you is the 25th, 50th, 75th, and 95th percentiles, so the spectrum of wages earned by people who graduated from UC Berkeley at any point in the last 60 or 70 years. Just link all of UC Berkeley students to what happens to them over the entirety of their working career. And you can see, obviously, that wages are growing roughly until their mid-40s, uh, at which point they, they uh, approximately stagnate. Uh, you can see, I, I'm not going to click on all of these toggles, but you can see all uh, sorts of different information about which kind of students end up with higher or, uh, or lower earnings. For instance, based on nature, how many humanities or science courses they took, how many uh, course departments they took. And you can see this is data we built for a couple of universities and uh, the URL is here. What I wanted to show you is what this distribution looks like. These are all kids who went to Berkeley, but in orange, this is everybody. And in blue, these are African-American students who go to Berkeley. You can see that, again, this is sort of it's similar to this place-based notion, even within locations, or in this case, within universities, you have this wide dispersion where all of these blue lines are pretty substantially below and up until their mid 40s actually uh, shrinking relative to the much higher orange lines. African-American students are coming out with a wage distribution that is pretty substantially shifted downward, even coming out of a university that I should note, uh, for the most part throughout this uh, 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 setting, did not have any affirmative action policy, which was illegal in the state of California at the time. So, okay, so I'll stop there. There's some sort of data to fix ideas and uh, I don't know, we'll come back to some of that. I, I I think we will. We're definitely going to come back to actually. You know, we can try to come back to place right now because um, that was a great visualization to look at some of those things, and we can talk about like um, 
the, the Chetty stuff that you mentioned, and I'd always thought it was the education of, I've been learned that it was the education of the mother that apparently had the biggest correlation uh, effect on maybe the educational achievement, but at least the achievement of the school. But there are all these other factors that come in. You're starting to, to, to at least try to figure out what it is, place being pretty highly uh, important. And then we, if you want to talk, if anybody wants to mention this, um, not only place, but and no matter what we thought that I guess the latest Chetty articles that came out, which prompted me to do this whole program was the fact, it really depends who your social network is. Um, you're welcome to talk about that if, you, if, if that's relevant or what that, that latest study coming out of his institute means. But um, let's let's go, uh, you know, Zach, I want to stay, maybe we'll just stay with you. If you want to keep going with place and then we're going to, and then I'll kind of go back around. Um, you know, what is it about place? You, you helped us look at something very specifically. So can you dig, dig a little more deeply into what does that mean? Why does it, is it just our country and why does this have it? Do people are able to move out? And then Charlie, you had mentioned some of the movie and I think we're moving to opportunities and, and uh, Marcus, you're talking about kind of fields and locations and communities. So um, let's keep with you, Zach, keep yeah. going with the concept of place. Yeah, yeah. So it, sort of interestingly, the degree to which we can explain variation across place in their degrees of promoting mobility for low income individuals in those locations is, is startlingly bad, which is to say, you know, there are a bunch of sort of plausible uh, first order hypotheses. Maybe some places have uh, better schools, or maybe some places have stronger social safety networks, or better childcare policy, or more liberal uh, uh, labor law. And it turns out that local policy uh, and local schooling availability are very poor uh, explainers of which places are good or bad. You mentioned this recent work uh, by Raj and his team looking at social networks. So it turns out that you can pretty you can do a, a surprisingly good job of guessing which places promote mobility on the basis of the share of uh, a low income students' friends who are high income. But that's not to say that like giving more uh, low income students high income friends will promote mobility. It just looks like the kinds of places where low income students are more integrated with their high income peers are also places that promote mobility. Uh, there have been a series of experiments uh, uh, starting in the 1960s and 70s that uh, you know, uh, sort of falling under this umbrella of moving to opportunity that uh, paid people to leave relatively low opportunity neighborhoods and move them elsewhere. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, those policies seem to have been uh, relatively unsuccessful for parents, but very successful for children um, uh, in you know, moving those kids to relatively better schools and leading them to better later outcomes. But I think no one believes that to be a sort of big picture, large scale kind of policy. We can't pick up whole cities and put them into other cities. That's going to have really substantial equilibrium effects. It's going to affect a lot of other people's lives. Uh, you know, I spend most of my time thinking about universities. I think universities sort of provide a nice setting in which it is feasible to promote very large scale moving opportunity experiments. In fact, that's exactly what large universities are. These are institutions that pull kids out of their local communities and educate them together in relatively integrated settings, generally uh, uh, in relatively uh, larger towns uh, that many of these kids are coming from, um, and before sending them back out, uh, either to large cities or back to their communities. Uh, outside of that, you know, sort of very startling uh, uh, setting at, at students, you know, at, at age 18 when kids get moved elsewhere, I think it's hard to imagine large scale moving exercises. On that, I think it was interesting you talked, you showed the, the Yale data, and I don't know if you're going to get into later, I know that Raj, they had also done the, the mobility scorecard, um, and what kinds of colleges, depending on access and success, are the best for kids coming out of the, and that's a whole separate area, but feel free to touch on that that later um, about, you know, that's the kind of the role of higher education and such. Um, okay, I think that's good for now. Marcus, I'd love to, kind of, let's, let's segue into, you know, kind of thinking about your experience and then the work you do with, with PLACE, including maybe with the collaboration within the field. Is that by types of, you're saying some people work in education, some people are working on this. Is that working across strata or is it better to kind of work in, in community based? You know, what is how does place um, and with that community um, come into play in, in the work that you do? Yeah, well, so typically it's it's of those options you articulated, typically it's it's in community. So it's recognizing that. Um, I mean, it's 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 great to have Charlie on here whose background is in, in health, right? Because I think we could certainly think about what are the linkages between health and housing and housing and transportation. And then housing and transportation and education. And so part of the, the work that, that I see um, when we think about place and place-based partnerships, it's 
how do we think about funding collaboration between a set of nonprofits that may work on a series of different topics? How do we think about funding collaboration to enable them to, again, achieve a lot of these outcomes we're talking about? Because it's it's very easy to criticize and say, well, you know, these two nonprofits or these three nonprofits, they should be collaborating more intently. If we know that you need greater coordination across these organizations, well, why aren't they working together better and more effectively? Because doing so would achieve these outcomes. Well, it's because it costs money and because it costs time. Okay, it takes time. And because many organizations are operating on very short time horizons, and so they don't have the time or the resources or the latitude to say, hey, rather than maybe fulfill my funding requirements to this philanthropy, why don't we sit down and talk about how to collaborate? And so I guess the point is to answer your question, Rachel, we're seeing a lot more organizations across different subsectors, so to speak, work together. But I think what's changing, what needs to change is actually resourcing that because in the absence of resourcing, it, it doesn't happen. It's not necessarily because organizations don't want to and don't see the value of it, but it's because we, you know, I can talk about this more later and I won't go on too much of a, of a rant, but we have a structure of philanthropy that disincentivizes collaboration. We have a structure that does, that incentivizes very short time horizons and that incentivizes like meeting specific metrics. And so in, until that changes, we can't necessarily see the level of collaboration that's needed but when it works, it's because it's resourced and funded, and it's typically happening at organizations that are working in community, but maybe across various dimensions that collectively contribute to economic mobility. Thank you. That's really an excellent uh, overview and description. We're definitely going to come back to some of these specific obstacles and blocks and what that really looks like in a detailed way, and then we'll kind of we'll move to what are the ones that are working that you've seen that's been positive. All right, Charlie, we're going to move to you because as much as Marcus has, has mentioned, um, uh, community-based, uh, you know, in healthcare. And other, so pick pick it up, sense of place that you've seen um, from from maybe from health and medicine and some of the work you've done. Sure, happy to. I must admit, Marcus, as I'm hearing you talk, it brings back um, actually a lot of the scars I have from being a nonprofit leader and, and issues of collaboration. And I'm more than happy to talk about what worked and what didn't, and, and certainly resonates with many of your many of your comments about the field and the challenge in the nonprofit world. But to speak more broadly about health, um, you know, a couple of things. I mean, the whole field, healthcare started thinking differently about what drives health outcomes and also what drives cost of healthcare was actually looking at variation in place. I mean, it was work that Jack Wenberg did in the you know, 60s and 70s, which said, gee whiz, you know, on one side of the Connecticut River, people are five times as likely or four times as likely to take out a uterus from a, a middle-aged person than, you know, <laughs> than people on the other side, or you know, uptown in New York City, you know, your tonsils are five times more likely to come out than, than somewhere else. So people knew at that point that the geography was important in variation in health care practices. Um, it took a while for health care folks, although public health people knew this forever. I mean, I knew this from, you know, that's how John Snow just started the whole field of public health when he looked at who got cholera and there were people that were right near the well that was contaminated by sewage, you know, back in England, I think in the 17th century, you know, quite a while ago. Um, but the field of health care became aware of this when, for example, Steve Wolf from now at Virginia Commonwealth University as a professor started publishing the zip code maps and the, uh, the, T, the maps of the subway system in New York or the T in Boston that showed again that mortality would vary 10 or 15 or 20 years, depending on which stop you're at, you know, whether you're in the Upper East Side or, you know, further up in Spanish Harlem. Or, you know, so those kind of variation in health outcomes by place became so stark that people needed to start paying attention to it. And the striking thing, and, you know, we have maps, Sandra Galeo has done these maps here in, in Boston. You know, the areas that have bad outcomes for diabetes, um, you know, might have Brigham and Women's Hospital you know, right there in the middle of it. So you can't you can't argue. Well, well, access to healthcare is really important. Don't get me to say you know access to healthcare is really important. I'll say that forty three million times. Nonetheless, you can't say that access to high quality care 
is the main driver for population health outcomes because it, it isn't. And to the extent that it is by health insurance, for example, it's in my view, not likely because of the health care that you get, but because it allows you to change jobs or to, you know, to be willing to take risks in your life and earn more money or go back to school because you don't need to be worried about, you know, paying your health care bills uh, instantly. So it's a very complicated relationship between health care access, which varies a lot by neighborhood and by characteristic of the people and health outcomes and neighborhoods really matter. Um, and there are lots of, you know, that's driven a huge amount of work at the University of Wisconsin, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Endowment, in investing in place-based initiatives to see if you can improve health outcomes at a community level. And, you know, we did some of that at, at NICHQ, narrowly focused on things like childhood obesity. Um, I think the main conclusion that the folks I've talked to from California Endowment, and I think Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is moving in this direction, is the strategy to change outcomes at the place for health outcomes, A, is to invest in the infrastructure of the social determinants like housing. And the other is to build power among the people in the community to take control of their lives, which is again, something that Mark has talked about that came out of that Gates uh, collaborative on economic mobility. So a lot of indirect pathways to improving mm -hmm. health outcomes, which are different than building, you know, a really high intensive intensive care unit, or don't shoot me, Joe Biden, investing in a cancer moonshot. I mean, those may be important, but that's not what's going to really change the needle in, in the health outcomes and the inequities in health outcomes in our country. Okay, good. Rourke, I'm going to pass it to you. You get to kind of add on whatever you'd like to add. It's kind of place concept as we before we move into some specifics on uh, obstacles and opportunities. Sure, yeah. I mean, just abstracting kind of the place question above neighborhoods and trying to think about why we might see such big differences between even metropolitan areas. You know, I think, you know, a, a couple just other factors lay on the table. I think everything is involved here. You know, I think it's uh, some of the most important determinants are uh, the strength of the local labor market, safety net workforce policies, and then the strength of the civil society, including nonprofit uh, density and quality. All of these things matter. But just to kind of uh, drill on, on the labor market, uh, trends. You know, this country, you know, following the Civil War, there was kind of 100, 120 years of, of, of place-based convergence, right? The, the South caught up with the rest of the country and, and places became more similar in, in the, uh, the nature and quality of labor market opportunities people had. And then, you know, in the last three or four decades, right, we've seen that trend reverse and places are becoming more different, right? So it's the, it's the old stuff we know about, you know, deindustrialization, globalization, really hollowing out um, uh, the industrial heartland, taking away those kind of pathways to middle-class jobs um, uh, that existed in many of those communities. At the same time, we're seeing the rise of these superstar cities, right? So on, you know, on the coast, Chicago, right? These places where we're seeing this kind of um, almost international group of highly educated folks who the returns to their, their skill set are, right, are just growing faster than ever, right? So that labor market polarization I think is is in a part a large part of place based story right because things tend to move in tandem in the same communities that saw you know the devastation wreaked by the loss of manufacturing jobs those are now the communities that are are, are seeing a declining tax base and increasingly you know this uh, problem with an inability to provide basic you know social services and education services at the same quality as you know other cities that might have not experienced this kind of manufacturing collapse so you know, I think that there are uh, 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 important reasons to think, um, you know, structurally about how the, the labor market, the, the, the role of the states in instantiating so much of our social safety net for better or worse, right, that all of these inequalities tend to overlap and compound. And so, you know, bad places that are bad on one of these dimensions tend to be bad on many dimensions, right, which is also why it's hard for us to ever really have a, you know, a true smoking gun for, for why some places are, are better for mobility than others, but because these things tend to all move together in tandem. Got it. Lots more to talk about, but I think we've at least touched on a little bit some of this common theme of place and, and we'll have lots of resources for folks if they want to delve more deeply. Uh, I apologize for those in the audience. I had not realized the chat function was limited to hosts and panelists. I just opened it again. So if you wanted to add some more stuff in chat, try it again now. Apologies. Um, 
let's see, uh, Zach. Let's let's come back to you. Um, I, thinking now, switching a little bit to delve deep more deeply into your each of your work fields uh, and some details, some examples of what are these blocks, these obstacles that are kind of have been in the way or in the way, because we've just talked about like on what the, what does it look like now with the definitions, what might some of the influential factors are, and what are the things that you're seeing it's that, you know, it's frustrating. We've been all, you know, a lot of people have been working on this decades, centuries, things seem to be not necessarily getting there. So what are the, some of the things we can't try to fix stuff if we don't really understand where the gaps are, what the problems are. So Zach, um, back to you, um, start, you know, starting us off with some, maybe there's some specific, specific problems or gaps and obstacles. Totally. So I'll just give three examples of obstacles and policies in brief that relate to this sort of area of higher education, one potential mobility pipeline for relatively low income Americans. Uh, the first thing I'll mention is access to selective universities. I already showed you that access for low income individuals to universities at, at either Yale or other universities like Yale is very poor. Uh, the Supreme Court will be deciding in the spring whether affirmative action is, it remains a permissible policy for admission at selective universities in expectation that policy will disappear. Uh, nine states have already banned affirmative action. And so we had a sense of what will happen when affirmative action is banned. What you see is dramatic uh, growth in these gaps, black and Hispanic students cascade into less selective universities and lose the, the relatively large returns that they had been gaining uh, from that access. Universities attempts at imposing policies that re replace affirmative action with race control alternatives uh, tend to fail and have failed in both blue states and red states uh, as they try the policies into place, uh, be they uh, policies that uh, provide access to top students from every high school in the state or test optional or test neutral policies that stop evaluation of individuals' test scores. Uh, a number of other things have been tried relatively unsuccessfully. Uh, a second, I think, area of sort of uh, policy interest in this higher education world uh, is not so much access to financial aid and growth in tuition as much as knowledge about what college costs for people like me. Uh, so you know, I think uh, as many people will know, you, know you, you apply to a college, there's a sticker price posted at that college. Many kids, uh, especially from lower income backgrounds, would never pay that sticker price in order to go to a university. But it can be very difficult prior to admission to that university to know what the costs will be. There exists an old generation of college cost calculators. They're very clunky and difficult to work with. I have never successfully put in a set of information to one of these calculators that gave me a price for a university. Um, and uh, there's been a movement at some state universities to just post uh, what you might think of as tuition transparency, trying to make very clear to people from different income backgrounds what college costs to improve kids, not just access through admission, but access through application. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to motivate kids to have an interest in higher education upon realizing how low cost it would be for people like them. Uh, final, uh, I think, uh, uh, bottleneck that until recently people were relatively unaware of was once kids get inside of universities and are choosing between college majors, at many universities there's quite limited access to lucrative college majors like engineering or computer science or economics. Uh, barriers put in place include GPA threshold, if you don't get an A in your introductory computer science course, you have to go study something else, or competitive applications. Uh, I think Yale only has one of these policies in global studies, uh, the current global studies major, but these policies are much more common at, uh, uh, at other universities, uh, especially large public universities that provide uh, the large majority of American higher education. And these, these meritocratic uh, uh, selection policies, again, drive stratification by pushing relatively less prepared, uh, high, uh, relatively low opportunity, but very promising students were admitted to the university on the basis of that promise. They get poor grades in their freshman courses, for which reason they're not allowed to earn degrees in those universities with the fields of science. That's a third model that the universities are just now trying to first identify and then find policy solutions. Okay, that certainly identifies uh, quite a few specific ones, but, but big ones. You know, I had thought that like 10 years ago or so, there was a movement, I forget the professor's name out of California, that they had realized, gosh, if you just send information about elite colleges and colleges to kids that are scoring higher in the SATs, they just didn't know. That's right. That was what was based on the like first gen low income students weren't even applying to because they just thought they couldn't get in. Forget like not even afford it. Is, is, is that sort of where some of this, I presume there's been more work done on that, not only in the fact of knowing it, but also that it doesn't, Peter Salovey is always touting the fact that it costs, in Connecticut, it costs for a low income person, it costs less to go to Yale than it does to Con College or something like that. Totally. Yeah, it's been sort of interesting evolution in this academic literature where small scale studies suggested that just sending out information about college costs 
would convince kids to go to college. That uh, those studies have not replicated at scale. So College Board has tried this now with millions of students, sending them out. You know, here's what, when your income bracket would have to pay to go to certain universities, uh, they have not been able to move the needle, pulling low income kids into universities. Instead, what has moved the needle is these pre-commitments. The University of Michigan goes to students and say, yeah, you know, you haven't applied to the University of Michigan yet, but if you get in, this is the price that you will pay to go to the University of Michigan. Uh, those policies, these policies have been very impactful for low income students. Oh, good. Okay, we're going to come back to some of these these positive influences. Um, Marcus, what is you, you had started to talk about some of the the obstacles, uh, maybe um, lack of collaboration, lack of fun, uh, funding. Can you give a little more into some of the details that you think that are sort of becoming roadblocks or obstacles to, to helping either population or field um, you know, for in, for mobility and improving people's lives? Sure. Uh, yeah, I can certainly speak to like what are what are some of the, the challenges at various levels. Maybe one just quick point I would make is you know it was really good to see the data at the beginning and if i looked at that the the data that that zach showed right like i of course went to yale and i would have been one of those bottom 20 percent like i grew up in public housing and the first person came out of college and and it and and i just say sort of anecdotally the other thing that i i'm not sure has been mentioned is also like what is the social experience of the person who grows up in poverty who goes to a school like yale and what are the set of resources or lack thereof that are supporting them beyond the, the, the knowledge? And so just to say that it, it strikes me that there's probably a question of sort of what are the support systems? And certainly places like Yale have invested a lot in that, but a lot of them weren't before. Just because you could get in and you knew how much it cost didn't mean you're necessarily gonna wanna go there or stay there or feel as you can get the most out of the education. But that notwithstanding to your question, Rachel, we did this um, sort of field scan and we interviewed a bunch of nonprofits uh, and various field actors. And they talked about sort of, why, again, why are we not seeing more collaboration in the economic mobility field and what will it take? And they first pointed to a set of what we would call presenting challenges, things that we see. So I see lack of visibility in terms of what others are doing. I see like a lot of competition for resources. I see not a lot of trust. And then when we begin to dig deeper, they pointed to what we called underlying challenges that sort of underpin those. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's that there is not a lot of data that is shared amongst these organizations. And so it's hard to know who's doing what. We actually mm -hmm. don't necessarily have sufficient resources to invest in human capital, which would then enable us to actually collaborate. Funding flows in a way that's not fully equitable. And so if you look at how funding flows, as I said before, it typically flows to white-led coastal organizations. And then they began to point to, okay, well, what actually underpins this? Like, why, why do we see that? Which pointed to what we called a set of root cause challenges. And I won't go through all of them, but the ones that I think are germane to this conversation is that number one, there remains significant concentration of financial resources and very few philanthropies focusing on economic mobility. And those philanthropies then control how money flows. Like time horizons are incredibly short. So we're talking about population level outcomes and wanting to see what happens over the lifetime of an individual. And we're saying, okay, we'll report out in two to three years what happened, or I need, an up, I need a monthly report on what happened. And so there's an inconsistency with the time horizons and what's actually needed. There is um, significant, we haven't really named it, coordinated opposition, blocking progress. There are coordinated entities that do not want economic mobility. And they have a certain set of messages and they have a set of tactics. And so those promoting it are not necessarily finding ways to combat it. And I think finally, what I would highlight is there are racist, sexist, other very harmful paradigms of who deserves money, who deserves to be economically mobile. This notion of the, the welfare queen, which you might be familiar with, right? There are these very harmful images of whose fault it is that you're poor. Oh, well, it's your fault. And so because of that, you should do something about it. And so the point is, and you know, what we found is until we began to talk about those root causes, it becomes hard to address the challenge of collaboration. It's not coordination. It's actually that like money is concentrated, time horizons are short, and there's not necessarily a perspective on who deserves to lead an organization, even if they don't necessarily have the right credentials. And so a lot of the work that we're doing right now is trying to actually identify a set of initiatives that would more concretely at least name and address these root cause challenges and an effort then to address some of those other things that we may see 
as the result of, 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 um, of, of the challenges I highlighted. That's great. And then we're going to come back to, to, have, to have you talk a little bit more. What are some of those um, initiatives and, and plans to try to address some of those root cause challenges? So I want to hear more about that. Um, let's see, Ch Charlie, um, you, you know, what have been some of the, 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 the blocks and, you know, maybe that you've seen from your um, perspective? Yeah, well, maybe to build on, again, some of Marcus's comments. I mean, fundamentally, when you look at the issues that we've all raised, ultimately, the solutions to really address this are at a policy level, government policy level, and to some extent at policy levels that relate to industry and wages and worker matters. Um, so, you know, it has to do with the distribution of wealth, it has to do with tax policy, it has to do with wage policy, it has to do with housing policy. You know, and, and the nonprofit work and the advocacy both can be at the margins and moving that and identifying innovation or when good policies come in are essential for effective implementation. But the, you know, the real changes are policy changes. And then the obstacles are just the ones Marcus mentioned. There's, you know, racism, you know, I, I think that just call it out. I mean, that's... Why is it that the safety net and the investment in addressing some of these issues, it's fundamentally uh, a fear and a concern about who's gonna get the money and who's, how is power gonna be shifted? You know, it's who's profiting from the current strategy that we have in our economy, which again, the Times just published data that economists, uh, maybe it was the Atlantic just published a graph that, you know, economists have known about, which was the, Wages and productivity started diverging in the mid 1970s, while productivity has increased on a straight line. Then, from the 40s to the 70s, uh, wages went right along with productivity, and starting the mid 70s, and you can think of some of the policies that we implemented then. Um, wages have basically been flat for people in the lowest, you know, 80 percent of the income distribution. So these are, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, I think those are the major barriers in front of us. I think they're you know, having had the privilege of working both in the healthcare field and the human services field, they're very different. I mean, even though the doctors and hospital administrators will whine until the cow comes home that they don't have enough money to do the services that they do, that they want to provide. If you compare the resources in the healthcare industry to the resources in the anti-poverty and the human services field, it's, you know, it's night and day. I mean, you know, even for even healthcare for poor individuals in most states, except parts of the South, um, you know, healthcare, uh, poor people can get healthcare through Medicaid and it gets paid for. People have a right to get it. You know, you go to the hospital in, again, most states, not all states, as a low income adult or really any state is a low, except maybe Texas, it's a low income child. Um, your healthcare is going to be paid for. You don't have enough money for housing you know, three chances out of four, there's no way, you know, and if, <laughs> you know, and if you need heating assistance, you know, if you get there in January, you know, the low income heating and energy assistance program is all spent out. So, you know, that I think is another, uh, those to me are the major barriers that are, you know, at, at, a, at a macro level uh, that are impeding our progress. And, you know, if we could address those, then I think there's a role for how nonprofits and others can, you know, with those resources work and provide what additional services or implementation services of those policies um, or developing new strategies uh, to move things forward. So that, that's my take okay. on the barriers. It's, it's okay, good. Really, I'm sure we'll come back with a few of those not policies. Okay. It's, not, it's not hidden. I think it's, you know, it's there. It's on the front page. It's right. you just look for it. Well, you know, speaking of your your references to wages in the labor market, I know Rourke, you've you've studied that, but if there's anything else you wanted to say, again, from your perspective, um, for some of the major blocks and obstacles in, in mobility. I mean, I actually think that that the other panel has kind of, of nailed the list, right? And it's and it's and it's a pretty straightforward list. So just to then follow on to sort of you know Charlie's um, suggestions, putting more kind of uh, specifics there, right? So. One, we need to improve the social safety net, of course, right? I mean, and, and there's so many dimensions of this 
Um, but it's also a time for optimism on, on, this, on this measure, right? So a lot of the policies, the programs, the conversations that we had around that pandemic COVID, COVID relief legislation, right? We brought to the fore the um, you know, ideas that have been bubbling around social scientists and policy communities for decades, but we never thought would ever happen, right? So for example, this universal child tax credit, right? Which had this very short-lived moment uh, uh, for about a year in the pandemic. In one fell swoop, we were making transfers to families that cut child poverty by more than 50%, right? So we even just showed, proved to our own self that if you actually just give families money, you can lift, raise them out of poverty, right? So from there, right, we're also now having these, you know, really exciting conversations about the, the, the ways that we could potentially expand uh, paid family leave. There are important conversations now about uh, the Section 8 program, right, which um, is, 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 a, is a really important source of housing assistance for those families lucky enough to get it. Why? Because it's not fully funded by the federal government. So there are many families out there who are eligible in many of these high cost cities in particular who just don't have access because there aren't enough funds, right? So there's a lot of things that we can do that we know that are staring right in front of us to really reform the social safety net. So that's one. The second, when we get to the labor market opportunities, we have to kind of accept that, right, these uh, Amazon warehouses aren't going away, right? That we're having this labor market polarization. Uh, and so one thing we need to do is just be thoughtful about how do we make those jobs at the bottom end of the distribution less terrible, right? So that requires thinking about um, raising minimum wage policies, having stronger regulatory regimes, uh, in addition to seeing what happens as this uh, resurgent kind of unionization effort works on the ground, hopefully that can be married with some sort of policy action uh, at the federal level. Uh, and then lastly, right, just beyond people thinking about reinvesting in places, right? So we're having some exciting conversations, I think, about what place-based policies look like? How can we take you know, all the federal government investments and try to be really thoughtful about where we locate some of these new technology innovation hubs? Can they be in parts of the country that could really benefit from that new type of investment and attracting a different type of workforce? Uh, and then you know, my specific research I'm really interested in is maybe we also need to start writing checks to some of those local governments, those cities and towns that have seen their tax base hollowed out, right? You know, maybe the rich, richer parts of the country through the federal treasury can, can actually directly subsidize the poorer parts of the country so that their, their schools and their social services, right, don't, don't collapse at the same time that their labor market does, right? So there's a lot to be done. Most of it's obvious stuff that we've known for a long time, but it is an exciting moment for the Overton window, right? That these are all things that used to just be talked about in, in, in policy conference rooms or in academic classrooms, but, but now, right, that we actually have uh, a real serious policy conversations where a lot of this stuff could happen. Great. I want to give anybody else, I don't, we don't have to, have to go around my names, but if, you know, Marcus and Zach um, or Charlie, any other thoughts about kind of policies that, that you think um, would be, that we've seen that are good, that may be been proposed, that should be, that, that would be really good interventions. And we're just, we're just working on government policy for right now before we move into kind of other kinds of, of interventions. Anyone want to add? Charles, you had mentioned a few, or Marcus? Well, again, I think, uh, you know, Rourke mentioned the child tax credit, certain something that, that we should see. I think that'll focus on income. I, you know, I'd like to start seeing something that's going to work on wealth, you know, talk whether those are baby bonds or other strategies um, to build wealth. I think, uh, again, a lot of stuff was actually in the Build Back Better uh, bill, you know, so, so there was massive investment in housing. Um, across, you know, and it's not just low income and affordable housing, it really needs to be housing across that also is going to expand housing for the middle class. I mean, housing just needs to be made uh, more affordable. So I think those are critical issues. I think actually immigration reform is part of our strategy. Uh, we need, we actually need immigration if we're going to, uh, in my view, have, you know, a productive workforce and a more balanced age distribution of our population. So, you know, there are a lot of those kind of policies. But I think, again, this is, I think, a shift, at least in my view, from a lot of the very focused safety net programs, like, again, the one I mentioned of LIHEAP, the low income heating assistance, and, you know, all these ones that are even SNAP and critically important as food stamps are. Give people money, give people, help people with wealth, provide people the opportunity for education from early childhood throughout. And then I think, again, providing appropriate supports, and, uh, um, and we can talk about what those supports are, um, you know, and then you don't need these piecemeal fragmented work um, 
and I think people will largely choose. I mean, that's what, when when you when you read the interviews uh, of the people who are receiving the child tax credit, for example, they talk about how they spend it, you know, and the same thing for the earned income tax credit. They say, I got my car fixed so I can get to work. I bought clothes for my kid, you know, where I enabled, enrolled my child in a program so they could learn more and do things. I was able to pay for childcare, you know, I took care, I mean, I went to college, you know, I so, you know, I mean, does 100% of people spend all their money the right way? No. Do I spend all my money the right way? No. You know, <laughs> so, it's an interesting like, way of addressing one of the ways that the government could or does some you know, uh, intervention on that front. I, I, I want to just let's, let's move back from, from sort of you know, policy stuff, which some of it's we can participate in, some we can't. Um, but but Marcus, you know, I, I want to get back to sort of like the flow of funding because you work with a lot of nonprofits and a lot of people in our audience are at and maybe we're fragmented and everybody's working at different pieces, housing, homelessness, uh, leadership development, et cetera. What, what are some of the positive things that you see that maybe you're working or could could have a positive influence in addressing some of the root cause challenges and the, some of the challenges and obstacles you've already identified? Sure, I'll, I'll be concise, which is perhaps something I've not been for the rest of the night. Um, not at all. Believe in lived experience. So if you're working at a nonprofit and you're thinking about how can I do my work more effectively, yes, data matters, as does the lived experience of poor individuals. And so if you're thinking about how do I actually utilize this conversation and embed it into my work, I would say, take it and also ask poor people, is this consistent with your experience? What do you think is needed to help? Uh, how, what do you think is needed to achieve the mobility you want? And I think beginning to really uplift those perspectives in addition to what we know and what's in the New York Times and et cetera, Doing those two things collectively, I think, is something that I'm seeing work, but certainly there's a long way to go and what I think is needed to get to where we want to be. Okay. Well, if any other sort of details of some of the maybe that you could talk about, either with clients or something that's actually seen some, you talk about interviewing, but maybe a, an approach that you've, you've worked or to help some of the nonprofits um, undertake. No, I mean, I know, and I'm not trying to be cagey, but I think, no, no, that, no, I just, it, yeah, no. I think it's oftentimes when you, when no one, like nonprofits or foundations or what have you are developing a program, they may okay. interview consultants such as myself. And I'm like, great. How many people have you interviewed who are actually experiencing the problem you're trying to address? And sometimes it's like, well, none, we didn't have time or the funder wouldn't pay for it, whatever it actually is, right? I'm not trying to be flippant, but I do think beginning to shift who are you consulting to inform program development. And over time, and again, I say this with tremendous respect, over time, it might be fewer people like us on this webinar and more people who may actually be the ones you're trying to affect. And I, again, I say that for myself, I fundamentally believe that we all bring a lot to this table. I certainly think we're passionate about economic mobility. I myself grew up poor. I have lived experience of having lived in poverty, but I have a different sort of perspective right now and all too often, I would say, as organizations are thinking through program development, strategy development, initiative design, getting feedback, perhaps beginning to identify, do you have appropriate feedback channels with the individuals whom you're trying to work with? And how are you balancing that vis-a-vis -vis others as well? And so I would say for those who are working in nonprofits, the extent to which they can shift to that, I've seen that work very, very well. Um, but that would sort of be perhaps my, my, my closing thoughts on this. I, I think that may be uh, really a brilliant way to kind of close out the conversation. We couldn't possibly cover what everyone uh, it covers. I, I, I hope each of you will um, be open to folks contacting you. I know you'll have public bios and stuff that I'm sure people will want to have. Um, if there, I'm just looking at the, at the, at the Q&A and any chats. If anybody has something that they want to um, cover uh, or answer, um, COVID outcomes versus what's going on now. But I, uh, somebody's, if you've raised a hand, it's a lot easier if you can just uh, type your question into the Q&A or the chat. Um, we'll try to quickly address it that now and see people are saying thank you. Um, I think we've touched a lot of stuff. I'm glad we had a, a perspective from, from policy, from where we sit comfortably behind our desks. And Marcus, thank you for, you know, keeping us grounded as well as reminding um, not only the, you know, the researchers, but the folks 
folks or the nonprofit folks, everybody, you know, think about and, and get the direct testimony and stories and lived experiences of folks to figure out what's actually working or not. And we can leave for another time of how that gets incorporated into research um, and, and some of this program decision making. But um, any closing thoughts from anyone before we uh, we close out for the evening? Um, I think we've covered a lot. I'm sure we could have many more. I hope we can have more conversations and bring more people to the table. Uh, I want to thank each of you, Charlie, Marcus, uh, Rourke, and Zach. Thank you for being part of the Yale community. Thank you for doing what you do. Um, keep us posted. Um, and uh, I hope we can continue conversations, folks in the audience. Uh, feel free to ask questions later. We will definitely provide a link to this video and to the podcast version later. If you have other resources, I know, that, um, for example, Zach, I did not know about that uh, chart from Berkeley that you showed us. I'm going to include that link. Uh, Marcus, anyone else, if you've got some other reports or things that you think would be useful, uh, anybody in the audience, send it to us. We'll include it on our list of resources when we send out the video. So gentlemen and everyone, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. I wish you a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you all at another YANA program. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel, thank for you. coordinating this. Great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.